Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Stockholm. Welcome to the seventh IEEE International Conference on e-science. And I want to introduce to you Professor Dan Henningsson from KTH. He is the director of the Swedish e-science research center that together with the uh, e-science uh, initiative essence here in Sweden is organizing this conference, and I'd like Dan to officially open the conference. Dan, please. Oops. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'd like also to welcome you, welcome you to Stockholm and to Nora Latin here, uh, and to the seventh IEEE International Conference on E-Science. Uh, we're very happy to, to have it here in, in Stockholm. And um, as uh, Erwin said, it's organized by uh, the Swedish E-Science Research Center, CERC, in collaboration with the E-Science uh, Collaboration, Essen. I, I would like to say a, a couple of words about uh, why we're so happy to have uh, the conference here. One of the reasons is that the E-Science have been uh, designated a strategic area by the government a couple of years ago here in Sweden. Uh, E-science was one of the 20 strategic research areas funded uh, by the Swedish government in 2010 and, and beyond. And that resulted in CERC, the Swedish E-science Research Center, which was uh, is headed by KTH, and where Linköping University, Stockholm University, and Karolinska uh, Institute that uh, is partners, and we have uh, about 30 million crowns per year to, to uh, do e-science research. Uh, the other uh, e-science center that was funded was Essence. Uh, it's headed by Uppsala University and what Umi University and Lund University are partners, and they have 26 million crowns per year. Uh, infrastructure is funded separately, but the HPC centers, high performance computer centers, PDC at KTH, and and you see in Lien Shopping is part of CERC, and the centers of Max, HPC, 2N, and Lunar is part of Essence. So in the future in Sweden, we will increase the, the amount of activity within e-science, and I think that's, that's very exciting. Uh, but what I would also like to do, uh, before I hand uh, the microphone back to Urban, is to thank our sponsors, and in particular, thank uh, Microsoft, uh, who is the main spo sponsor of this conference, and, Tony Hay, we had a nice dinner yesterday, and, and Microsoft is essentially providing all of the nice dinners during this, this week. <laughs> so, so we're very happy about that. Um, we have also uh, several sponsors, uh, IEEE organization, AMD, Adaptive Computing, and Vetoscopes Road at the Swedish Research Council, which is also providing uh, funding for us. So I'd like to thank all the sponsors very much. And then I leave the word back to Urban by just uh, leaving you with a CERC vision through e-science enable world leading research within strategic areas and this is what uh, this conference is all about. Thank you. Okay, thank you Dan. And I'm very happy now to announce the first uh, keynote speaker. Uh, probably I don't need to introduce him much. Most of you will know him for many years. I'm very happy that we have Peter Coveney from University College London with us. Peter is also the director of the Center of Computational Science there, and he is leading the Virtual Physiological Human uh, Network of Excellence, among other many, many other things that are probably going to touch in his talk a little bit. And he's been doing e-science for, I don't know, decades probably, you can say. And uh, he's going to discuss a very challenging problem in e-science, computational biomedicine. And I'm really looking forward and I'm very happy to have Peter here. Peter, please. Right, thanks very much indeed. I don't think I need to say too much about the challenges of e-science when we have to deal with interoperability problems between Macs and PCs. Uh, given that we have such facile ability to do that, it won't trouble you at all to realize that I'm talking about 
computational biomedicine, which in a sense is the big challenge in e-science because it brings together uh, all of the things that we have to worry about. In particular, <coughs> one of the big issues that's constantly uh, profiled in e-science discussions today, data, fourth paradigm, how we deal with it. Of course, you get it in spades here, and increasingly so, as I think most people will be aware in terms of uh, producing data at uh, speeds that are completely unexpected and unprecedented from sequencing, genome sequencing, and the challenge of how we deal with that in the future. Of course, the data challenges there are not just sheer volumes and how we move it around. It's also fraught with uh, uh, data protection, uh, security, privacy issues. But by now, it, it should be clear to everyone this is a, this is a tremendous uh, holy grail, I would say, for the 21st century. Erwin kindly mentioned something called the virtual physiological human. I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. That's one of the themes here. But the, the virtual physiological human as a seven-year initiative, in a sense, is just a drop in the ocean. This is a program for the entire uh, 21st century. And be under no illusions that we claim to have achieved things uh, of dramatic significance now. But the whole program is predicated on knowledge and experience built up over the last uh, 10 years or so in doing e-science, how we build increasingly complicated environments to handle um, challenges of this sort. So when, when I think about e-science and, and e-infrastructure, I'm thinking of three things primarily. They're the people, what it takes to do this kind of thing, the background, the training, have we got that right? Then there's the software. Uh, how do we develop software? How do we build um, complicated software systems? And then there's the hardware, inevitably, that's necessary to run some of the applications. And uh, as always here, it's a, it's, the interest is because it's nonlinear. The sum of the, the parts, um, we, we want the whole to be much greater than that. So we don't want to concentrate on only one of those three. We, we need them all to be working together. So I want to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, what our background and history is, how we've um, enjoyed working in this domain for some time, e-science in particular, then look at what uh, the challenge of computational biomedicine is, just a, a glimpse at the tip of the iceberg, how we then handle data storage and security issues, say some things about the virtual physiological human, and touch on uh, an increasingly large number of infrastructure projects that are becoming aligned with these sort of requirements. They're typically on the international scale. I'm thinking of EU ones here. So if you looked at uh, the website for the Center for Computational Science that I lead, you'd find the catchphrase for us is advancing science through computers. That means that we're, in a way, completely agnostic to the problems. We're interested in the challenges that uh, face us in doing um, science, modern science, through using new evolving computer paradigms. And uh, those things have evolved, of course, through uh, a number of uh, generations. If you're talking about serial computing, there's been parallel computing, then there's distributed and grid computing and cloud computing. And all of these things uh, are, are areas we're interested in because they enable us to do faster, better, different, new things that were not possible before. And that's really what our own ag agenda is. So in trying to pursue that kind of um, broad aim, these are the topics that, that preoccupy us in, in terms of computational science. Maybe computational science can be thought of to some extent as a, a curious discipline that draws heavily on computer science. In a way, it's an engineering area. We're talking about developing theories, then models leading to algorithms, codes, uh, their development and implementation. We're worrying uh, all the time about getting the highest performance we can. You'll see why in a computational biomedicine challenge. It's not just more of the same, qualitatively different, because uh, if you're going to do something relevant here, it's only relevant if you get the results on a time scale that matter to people who have to take urgent decisions. And then we're manipulating lots of data, and typically that data and the resources could be all over the place. So it's distributed. We depend heavily on interpretation of the data, so visualization is important to us. Steering, inter the ability to interact with 
uh, an analysis, maybe a simulation in real time as it's, t as it's going on matters to us. So we've spent significant periods of time looking at uh, ways of doing computational steering. Historically, we've come out of a background in uh, sort of physical sciences, condensed matter, physics and chemistry, materials and so on, and the life sciences. And that, as I'm saying here, the area of translational medicine, e-health, and topics like virtual, the virtual physiological human all speak to the data deluge and how we handle that aspect of computational science. So just to give you a feel for the sort of challenges and opportunities there are in this area, I'll, I'll take you through a couple of sort of case studies, two or three of them, which typify what, what opportunities there are if you can manage to choreograph and manage the um, infrastructure in the, the most timely way appropriate. So behind all of this is this new era of, of patient-specific medicine. Uh, and it depends completely on our ability to handle digital data. I mentioned earlier, and I'll come back to it uh, again, just the idea that you can get a, a whole human genome sequenced now in a matter of minutes suggests to you that uh, there's going to be huge opportunities to treat people on the basis of that kind of information. We'll be able to tailor, indeed people are beginning to do that already, medical treatments based on such characteristics. M much better to do that than just handle a, a sort of Joe average person and rely on statistical techniques that might cure, let's say, 70% of, of, of those suffering from a, an illness but leave the 30% who aren't cured no, none the wiser for why things have failed for them. So what, the use of patient-specific approaches should be clear. If we can administer those or perform <coughs> things like simulations in advance of carrying out operations, could be surgery, treatments like that, then we should expect to redu uh, increase the chances of success, to reduce uh, the number of uh, failures of actual treatments and all the traumas that go with people having to have multiple treatments. So it's a, a big challenge and an area that's simply here to stay. It's not about to go away. If you took one illustration of this, this is at the level of uh, whole um, human brain blood flow. Just as an I illustration of this, this is going to be marshalling patient-specific data, typically from um, imaging modalities here at CT scans. If you can get the data, perform uh, reconstructions and seg uh, segmentation and reconstruction and then merge the patient specific image with a flow simulation and do all of this fast enough prior to some kind of uh, interventional neurosurgery. It may be for a stroke patient, someone who's suffering from an aneurysm. I think you can see the, the uh, potential here to, to, for a surgeon to be able to investigate what intervention to carry out prior to actually doing it because the intervention effectively can only be done once it's irreversible and it could lead to uh, irreparable brain damage. So in terms of state of the art for things like 3D ro rotational angiography, we work with uh, uh, interventional radiologists, for example, at University College Hospital. They can generate images of the sort you're seeing there. If they have to handle uh, patients with aneurysms uh, and so on, they're confronted with images like this, and then they have to take decisions as to what the treatment might be. If we're talking about uh, patients suffering from aneurysms and the like, the trouble is that the, the blood flow has been distorted from what it would be in a regular human uh, uh, vasculature, and so some of the blood is being prevented from reaching parts of the brain that it should be getting to. Depriving the brain of oxygen can lead to a irre irreparable or irre irreversible brain damage. So an interventionalist will have to decide what action to take. And the, the, the actions are in several senses. Uh, and one of the extreme cases might be using uh, things like superglues, epoxy resins, to put into the vasculature to try and force the blood flow to go into the right directions. That can only be done once, and as I say, uh, statistically at the moment, that kind of operation is successful maybe 30, 40% of the time. And if it's not successful, then it can be very bad news. So what one is talking about here in terms of modeling and simulation and managing patient-specific approaches 
is to see if you can develop the infrastructure to parallel or go alongside what a, uh, a surgeon would normally be doing. On the left-hand side of this image, you can imagine a patient might be presenting and have to be analyzed. It could be accident emergency, uh, someone facing a, a severe problem. You get the CT scan obtained, and then typically the surgeon will stare at these three-dimensional images. They're static. He doesn't see any blood flow. But what if you could combine all of that data with a flow simulation of the sort that's shown here and get the results into the clinical context fast enough that they could do a simulation prior to doing the intervention. That's the ambition of this work. And it takes the images. It requires you to be able to largely automate the segmentation and reconstruction as you go around this simulation loop. Uh, you combine uh, the patient-specific vasculature with what here is a a lattice Boltzmann simulation of the blood flow. Lattice Boltzmann is particularly appealing in these contexts because any serious three-dimensional uh, physiological model is going to require access to high-performance computing resources, a fortiori, if you're going to get the results back uh, in a hurry. So, and, and these codes are extremely scalable, which means that I can uh, run such codes if I have access to machines with tens of thousands of cores or more on them that number of times faster than I could run them on a single core machine or equivalently much bigger systems. And I want to run these simulations and get the workflow such that the pipeline from starting to finish is as short as possible. The, 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 the output here will only be of interest to the clinician if it comes within, let's say, 30 minutes. Otherwise, as they say, it's of academic interest alone you can go off and write your publication about it, but it won't have influenced the decision. So the challenge here, it's, it's a really big one in computational science. Can you marshal all of this stuff and make it spew out relevant data in a hurry? On top of that, not only are you managing data that's uh, private and needs to be secured, there's a big usability issue here. Uh, clinicians are very busy people. They're also very smart, and they understand the importance and value of this kind of work. But they typically are not trained in any sense to understand what's going on. And if they're going to use a tool, it had better be very usable. So I could show you slides. I don't intend to. They t uh, of the usability of tools that call them e-science tools in clinical practice. And the uptake of those decays as an exponential function, decaying exponential function of the number of mouse clicks you ask the clinician to uh, engage in. So more than two mouse clicks and your wonderful application is almost dead in the water before it takes off. You've got to have extreme usability and fa facility of using these tools. So that's one illustration. I'm not going into the details. There's plenty there and published now. This is another example a harbinger of what's going to be happening in this post-genomic era. Uh, that is, once we have human genomes sequenced. In the case of HIV, this is already happening routinely. Here we're sequencing uh, the, um, the, vir the, the virus, the retrovirus that's actually causing the infection. And people will probably be aware why HIV is a challenge. It's a, it's, it's a kind of prototypical example of what happens in most infectious diseases. A virus is concerned it likes to do nothing more than uh, emulate Dawkins' selfish gene, that is, keep going, reproducing itself. So if you throw something in its way, like a drug, uh, it will do everything it can to continue to function while evading the effect of the drug. So uh, HIV has uh, a life cycle in, in which one of the enzymes that's produced, called it, uh, protease, which is responsible for the maturation of the virus, can be targeted. There are several others. Reverse transcriptase and integrase are two others. But this one is showing the protease case. It's a small enzyme. It's actually two monomers together. It has a mere uh, 2 by 100 um, amino acid sequences. Uh, but the problem is that no matter how much money you spend developing drugs here, hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars per drug, you know full well by Dawkins uh, and Darwin that the, that the virus is going to find a way of stopping that drug working. 
And so you ha this, this is an activity which isn't about drug design. It's about trying to decide which of the drugs that you've got on the market could be used best for this patient. Therefore, it's paradigmatic of patient-specific medicine. It depends on you knowing what the sequence of the infecting virus is because the sequence will influence what that particular molecular structure of the protease is. So we've had several uh, EU projects, and I must say a lot of the work we do in the e-health domain nowadays is funded uh, at the EU level. This gives us a, a, has given us an opportunity to look into these problems over quite a long period of time. Some of the projects are mentioned here. So th the idea is that uh, if you deal with this problem with, with conventional approaches, that would be a database. It's what I call a Baconian approach. You try and build a database of all the patients that have ever had an analogous treatment before, get all their sequences, try and understand where the mutations are that might be leading to a particular level of resistance, and th then use online clinical decision support tools. These Baconian approaches are, are a glorified form of co curve fitting or um, 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 statistical inference. There's no model in a, in, a, in a sense of understanding it. The models are just full of parameters from the fitting, which depends on what data you've produced. So what's at issue here is if you want to go one notch more and make this a more interesting patient-specific task, you actually want to start bringing in an alternative philosophy of science, which is the one that's much more common in the physical sciences, Popper, not Bacon's theory, which is, which is the one that suggests we actually do understand the underlying mechanisms here. So we then trying to calculate, in this case, binding affinities for the protease on these individual drugs, where there are really no free parameters in our prediction. They just come out of our understanding of the physical model. So what we'd like to do is be able to run these kind of calculations, and once again, to avoid them being of merely academic interest, the challenge in e-science is to do these fast enough to influence a clinical decision. And just to take a look at what's at stake there, this is work that we published a couple of years or so ago, which just begins to lift the corner of the veil here. It's taking uh, these sequences that would be obtained by a virologist, so they're patient-specific calculations, and then they're going to be patient-specific calculations of the binding affinity of an existing known drug to that patient's sequence. The, the first thing you've got to be able to do is show that there may be uh, a good validation or verification shall we say, a correlation between the experimental binding affinity and that that's computed in the theory. And that's what this plot is actually showing you, experimental versus uh, uh, theoretical calculations. In this case, actually, the discrimination is clear. We have a wild type which binds strongest to the drug, uh, this drug in this case being, um, I think, sequinavir, the earliest drug developed for HIV patients for protease. And then as you go to increasing levels of uh, resistance mutations, the binding affinity drops off. So what ultimately the clinician wants isn't these detailed numbers, but to be able to get a clear ranking of the order of efficacy of the drugs. How do you do those calculations? Uh, they are, uh, to some extent, you could say standard. This isn't a community full of people who do, say, calculations of free energies uh, as you would do in the physics or chemistry community, you could say these are fairly well-defined calculations. The issue isn't so much what the methodology is, but how you deal with all the data that's necessary to get the result. This is the kind of data-intensive workflow that's necessary. And we're now going to be running very, very large numbers of models and simulations. We cannot anymore be doing this on an individual basis, one student, one calculation. The entire shooting match has to be orchestrated and automated. So we go into the protein data bank, we build models. There'll never be crystal structures for all these mutants. There are too many. It's a combinatorial explosion. We have to use some methods from bioinformatics, like various forms of homology modeling, to get the first estimate of what the structure is. Then we run a series of equilibrations to get the model going. And then we will launch production simulations with a vengeance on large machines. All of these simulations are parallel computations. Each one might be using 64, 128 cores. Well, a, a few years ago, that might have been the size of a, cap of a capability computer, but now it's utter chicken feed on a petascale machine. In the time it takes to do one of these calculations, I've done a gazillion of them. 
Why does that matter? Uh, because I can get all the results back in maybe a day or two rather than many months. The statistics or the error bars on the calculation will be massively reduced because the sampling is much enhanced. And therefore, the quality of the answer is going to be more reliable. And that's the sort of thing that a clinician will want to know. So you just have to get involved in dealing with the management of large quantities of data, computations themselves, which generate data, which often seems to be forgotten in these discussions, and then bringing it all together. So Jim Gray, great guy, he said, uh, bring the computation to the data. If you're running a computation on a petascale machine, uh, that petascale machine ends up producing terabytes and even petabytes of data. The data accumulates on the machine, and then you have a problem. You can't take the computation to the data, then the data is int intimately associated with the simulation, and it's that data that you then have to manage. So then you have to develop all sorts of tools that manage this stuff, we've developed binding affinity calculators to do this. These are all workflow-based. So as soon as you see that, you begin to understand the real power and potential for such approaches. If you imagine a post-genomic era where you have the full uh, sequence of an individual, you can look at it and ask questions about what's the nature of that patient's, shall we say, epidermal growth factor receptor. And this is an example that's implicated in cancer and lung cancer. What's the state of the mutations there? What drugs exist on the market? Which one shall I give this patient? And in fact, generically, this is then just another example of the same question that I addressed with HIV. I want to know which of those magic pills on the left is the best one to treat this given patient. So I want to rank them. And I'll have to do calculations of this sort to get an answer of that kind. Alternatively, it may be there are two mutants and I've got one drug which of these sequences is the one that's going to respond most effectively. This is the kind of information that's potentially available by this approach. To repeat, it's massively data-centric, data-driven, data-intensive, but very computationally demanding as well, and all needed to be done securely and very fast. In this case, the time scale we'll get away with is probably a few days. If the answer comes back in two weeks or so, the patient may no longer be with us or uh, will have evolved a resistance. This is why these answers have to be obtained in a hurry. This is just data from one of our papers on the EGFR case. I want to talk now about medical data storage and security issues. So the bigger picture for us here is the sheer heterogeneity of the types of data we're dealing with. It's very large scale and it comes in all shapes and sizes. I've been mentioning genome data which is becoming much more common now. There are regular patient uh, electronic health records to manage. We've got medical imaging data, which can be pretty large scale. And the challenge in dealing with uh, patient-specific medical treatments is actually being able to marshal this stuff and then use it in a wise way to assist in the clinical decision-making. Until you bring, put an environment together where this data is all available, interoperable in some sense and usable in a single simulation or workflow, then you simply can't judge properly how to use it all. So first you have to have environments where the heterogeneous data can be put together, can be displayed. Please remember, this is for the benefit of clinicians, so the interfaces, the front ends, are going to have to be very easy and appealing to them. And then how to work with that data. Some of it is extremely large and how we move it around is a great challenge. Maybe someone in the audience will tell me, I, I never remembered if this apocryphal phrase is Jim Gray's or not. Uh, never underestimate um, the bandwidth of a station wagon. If we're dealing with large quantities of data, uh, again, for these purposes, we'd like that data to be shiftable in a hurry. That speaks to the mechanism we use for doing that. Do we just put it on disk drives and ship it? Do we have networks that are capable of supporting the endeavor? So again, there's a trinity of things for me that matter in any project that I'm involved in as regards just the hardware. The three things that are essential, each one, are the data and the storage issue, the compu computational aspects, and the network, all three of them together. Give me them all together at the same time, at the right level and quality of service, and we will have a huge step change in what we can deliver. If you give me only one of those, it's just 
bits and pieces again. So we're fighting against the fragmentation. In the security aspects of this, we're obviously faced by a lot of legalities, uh, ethical considerations, um, how we manage data, the, the challenge of international projects, EU ones, is of course we're usually collaborating with partners who are um, transnational, so we have to pay attention to what we can do across boundaries, which is why in some of the projects we're involved in, we employ um, sort of e experts in information technology law. Incidentally, UCL itself has now decided it probably would like to make an appointment in that space. What's interesting about medical law is that un unlike Anglo-Saxon law, most of the time you just have to know all the other the cases that are precedent and then rule on the next incident. Here we're making the rules up as we go along. So it's a rather different form of, uh, of law than most. For instance, today you might generate whole genome sequences to treat a cancer patient and then you uncover some awful uh, syndrome that's revealed by the sequence that you hadn't expected and the question you have in an ethical sense is do you tell the patient what you've discovered? You may have no means of uh, uh, treating the patient. All sorts of kinds of questions come up here which are intellectually challenging in a legal sense as well. So then there's the more traditional ones of information assurance. We're concerned about authentication, authorization, and auditing, and the delightful question down at the bottom of how we manage this data, where does it actually sit? And typically, again, you've got three kinds of answers. You could have some monolithic centralized database. You might have what I call a federated infrastructure, which is distributed under some sort of system. Uh, incidentally, the Brits, in a European sense, the British, when they see the word federal, think it's terrible. It means uh, we're in the EU, uh, the, the center of all power is Brussels, and it's the French who are calling the shots. Of course, that's a very poor m model of federalism. You have to only understand how uh, the federal government works in Germany to understand you can have federal infrastructures where power is dispersed massively to the periphery. I am in a federal institution, and it's the University of London. If I ask you to look at the University of London for a minute, uh, there's someone called the Vice Chancellor of the University of London. He has essentially no power whatsoever. The power is vested in the, inst in the institutions that are part of it. So there are all kinds of ways of managing these relationships. And then you've got the cloud one, which for me is the kind of, it's a grid, it's a business model of grid computing. It implies there's a third party in there. Why is the third party getting involved? They want to make money out of it, and other people will benefit because someone's taking the weight off their shoulders. So in a cloud scenario, we'll put all our medical data in some repository, could be Microsoft, Google, Amazon, the names we know and love, and let them manage all our data. And of course, that itself immediately raises deep questions for people who are handling medical data and there are political issues to do with that. So this whole area is completely uh, abounding with challenges. I have only to show you a snapshot from, I think this is a BBC website, about uh, all kinds of contro controversies and polemics that develop when someone leaves a non-encrypted laptop somewhere in London and it's discovered that we know all kinds of information about patients. This is what uh, typically the health service lives in fear of and leads to the Fort Knox mentality where we put all the data behind some massive secure firewall. The patients themselves then find it extremely difficult to get hold of it. Uh, the scientists and the translational people who need that data are equally thwarted and the vision of a patient-specific medicine goes down the tubes for another few years. I mean, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is turn this whole issue on its head. Potentially, that everyone, I'll show you a project that's proposed to do just this, to give every single person maybe on this planet their own uh, human genome sequence and that they can be responsible for where they put it. And once you start empowering patients and citizens with this data, they can decide how they want to share the data, not the people who are behind and running Fort Knox. So as part of our own work in this area, and historically going back into the early days of, of grid computing, uh, many of you here will probably know and love um, Ian Foster's Globus. We've wrestled with that for uh, many a, a long year, and two of the biggest impediments to usability of that 
are the sheer heavyweight nature of the middleware itself and trying to deploy it. So we have ways of avoiding that deployment totally. And the other component, again, is the need for many users to handle uh, e-science certificates, grid certificates, which may be fine for the uh, initiated and those that work with me who take a lot of pain because they're expecting to get considerable gain. The moment they walk through the door of our center, they have to get their e-science certificates and sort those out so that they can work in these environments. But most people really don't want much to do with it. So we've developed tools to eradicate the experience of um, certificates from the, the, the user experience here. And it, there are digital certificates still lurking behind the scenes, but they're, they're not accessed by, um, by, the, by the end user. The, the secret of this is simply that we do what we call audited credential delegation. It's an extremely respected, actually, com uh, computer science solution. So we, it's all based on formal theory, so we can analyze w uh, rigorously how correct the approach is. But essentially what it's doing is taking the uh, digital certificate and handing it to someone who's in control for that group or virtual organization. Everyone else then comes in with their local credentials. And in this case, we're developing a, a form of this which will uh, draw on shibboleth that might be available early, well, by the end of this year now. In fact, it says October, but it, it's looking more likely to be in December. So we can then do fine-grained uh, uh, security here because we can set up these rules locally as, uh, based on parameterized role-based access control as to who can take access to what um, tools and services. We're calling the shots. Needless to say, this breaks some of the original rules. We spend most of our time, not most of it, a lot of our time fighting policy issues. Here it's the policy of one user, one certificate, so that the resource providers can always trace who did what. Rest assured, if you're a resource provider, we have the mechanisms here to track and exactly who did what through this environment, but it doesn't require the one user, one certificate. So in fact, it's a mechanism that will allow you to build a virtual organizations very quickly on the fly, the, u the users having very little to do with it. So at this moment, this audited credential delegation is part of a, the other middleware tool that we've spent quite a while uh, developing. This was the other component of wrestling with uh, Globus. Uh, requirement number one was to make sure that no user had to get near Globus on the client side. So the application ho hosting environment does that for you. It's a lightweight front end, but then it gives you access to uh, resources on a distributed, in a distributed environment. This thing is tested and deployed on a whole range of um, infrastructures, and the combination of the two is itself recognized as a science great gateway on the Exceed infrastructure that's now taking off in the US. So the picture of this thing is, I haven't got time to go into it, that, that uh, a, uh, a user comes in through the application hosting environment client and is then subject to all forms of authentication, auditing and authorization before they can get access to that set of tools and services that, that they're entitled to. And in this picture, some of the resources that they'll need to get access to at this point in time are going to be, that looks like a cloud, you know, distributed resources that are outside the local context for the reason I told you earlier we often have to invoke high-performance computers to get our results on a time scale that's relevant. That's just a snapshot showing how easy it is for a PI or systems admin to set up a new project and a new VO using the ACD stuff. So the, the application hosting environment itself is something based on RESTful services. Uh, the, the most important thing for us about this is it's a mechanism, so we emphasize applications here, not jobs, because Traditionally, people who do high-performance computing are locked into a tedious and utterly uninspiring batch job mentality. I must submit my jobs to a queue, wait my turn, and eventually something comes out. You'll understand that type of approach would never work for clinical decision-making. But we will have typically applications that are rather complicated. They might be workflows, or they might be something where I need to set up a simulation and a visualization at the same time. So this is powerful enough to deal with that. But the key thing is the last bullet down at the bottom, that it's very unintrusive. We make no requests or expect any returns of favor from the service providers. They have to do nothing for us to run these tools. 
And ultimately, this is the secret to being able to use, to be agile and exploit grid infrastructures. You cannot get locked into endless discussions with policies uh, with resource providers that take years to agree. And treading water is a great way of waiting until your project is finished, and then we move on to someone else who has other demands. So, you know, it's an environment for us which goes from the desktop to the highest end. And the secret of it, as everyone will know who does e-science, is interoperability, compliance with standards, so that if everyone adheres to the same standards, our tools will interface to them. So we can interface our tools straight to EGI and uh, to PRACE as it now is, and exceed, just because we know what the interfaces are. As far as an end user is concerned, they see this whole thing as a completely uniform, homogeneous environment. Then you can pick and choose the resources you require. Some of them may be set up to do urgent computing. That means they'll run your job instantly or in a next-to-run mode. You, you have the opportunity of picking from a huge uh, ecosystem. Now, one thing just to throw, I mentioned networks before. You're aware we do stuff with US resources and in Europe, needless to say, Data is part of the picture. We need to move data around. Transatlantic links are very important to us. And at the moment, that's more of an aspiration uh, than a, a, an existing setup here, because we have gone backwards in international links in terms of uh, what's available in the last few years from, say, the UK to the US. And, and we really need to do better in the future. Usability, this is a bit of a, a, a throwaway comment, but you know, we've ended up having to follow very careful usability guidelines, uh, best practice in computer science to try and establish what the tools are that we develop, what their benefits are as far as users are concerned. And so this is a, a recent publication, it was in the, I think, 2010 All Hands, UK All Hands meeting and published earlier this year, which is just taking a look at these, the usability issues for these middleware and security mechanisms, and actually quite a sizable usability trial with 40 users drawn from other various places in UCL, including things like the law school, where you wouldn't normally expect someone to be carrying out computationally demanding tasks, and inviting them to uh, see how they get on with these different combinations. This paper just reports uh, how, what the outcome of uh, the studies are. And suffice to say that when you use uh, this application hosting environment and the audited credential delegation, which, remember, banishes uh, any user certificates, the users gravitate to that approach uh, like bees to flowers or honey. <coughs> so then we have gone on to build uh, medical, sort of clinical data repositories. This is a case that uh, we've worked on for one of our EU projects called Contra Cancrum, which has been a cancer project addressing lung uh, and breast cancer in the last three years. It led to a tool, it's, it's open source, and uh, based again on components that are interoperable and standards, as indicated here, that are open and well-defined, so that we can then produce a centralized in, and integrated repository of data that clinicians and researchers can all get access to. This is a, a, a sort of architecture diagram for what it looks like, the web interface, how the clinicians see uh, what's available in the services, the kind of heterogeneous data that underlies it, and some of the tools. GS Engine, developed by Cifranet in Krakow. We've collaborated with them over the years. Application hosting environment, the ability to move uh, some of the workflows onto remote resources and then get the data and results back. So we spend significant amounts of time producing front ends that are usable and appealing. This is just, I haven't got time to go into all the details of this how you can trace any given patient in the system, what the treatments of this patient have been over periods of time, and uh, what their other medical data looks like. Again, this can all be wrapped using that ACD environment to give a secure, uh, authorized, and authenticated service, uh, and, uh, you, and the auditing is all there as well. So virtual physiological human, um, that's uh, an exciting initiative that kicked off in, at the beginning of FP7, uh, the idea being, um, again, more to do with patient-specific medicine, can we build and develop computer models that will help in clinical decision-making? Any project that's funded by the 
virtual physiological hu human initiative is going to have to be, by definition, multi-scale. It needs to be connecting at least two of the levels that are indicated on the right from the molecular upwards. Much of it's at the highest levels, incidentally. And then there have to be people like clinicians involved to guide the work in the right direction. So this is just another picture of similar stuff I've shown you before, telling you about the the scale, the type of data, the heterogeneity, the size of the data that's involved, how we handle it, the need to be able to bring infrastructure together on demand and to support uh, the decision making significantly through running some of the patient specific data through high performance computing tools. The network of, of excellence that Erwin said I, I'm involved in leading has developed and promotes standards and ontologies here. Again, if you're talking about developing a so-called virtual physiological human, it'll be obvious to everyone that I'm not expecting something to open the door any minute now, come down and replace me uh, in giving the rest of this lecture, much as I might wish to have that happen. But if we're developing some project, which is a 21st century long one, and we don't want to run into problems with our software development, we want to build uh, increasingly complicated representations of the human body at different levels through open standards and as far as possible open source software in a way with Lego pieces one would do this to plug and play. We have smaller components that are being tried and tested typically today at the organ level. They may be heart models, blood flow models in the brain and so on. And then we want those models to interact with each other. We don't want to have to w wash them away and start new ones. So we want to build with components, and that can only be done in an organized way. That's one of the tool objects, uh, objectives of the tool BPH toolkit. We promote new ways of, of training people in this area. It should be clear, I think, to most that the way med medics and clinicians are being educated and trained today doesn't leave them in the most ideal situation to take advantage of all this e-science e and e-infrastructure. So there's a huge uh, scope for for developing new initiatives in teaching. Incidentally, we have a big uh, VPH 2012 conference later in 2012 on this stuff. So there's a big set of projects that exist today. The funding kind of rivals the scale of the UK e-science initiative under Tony Hay. It's of the order of 250 million euros now. There's an, a ninth call, a call nine, coming out on the 12th of December. In fact, we're hosting that at UCL. There'll be another 65 million euros available for projects in this space then. So the idea is you start populating uh, the physiologic, virtual physiological human with, with individual activities that need to be coordinated. So we do develop it, developments in one of these projects. We expect the tools to be available and interoperable with those that are developed in others. That means that it's a big challenge running this because many EU projects are big on their own. A network of excellence is sizable, probably has 12 or 13 partners. But one of our roles is, is not to be internally navel-gazing, but promoting interactions between ourselves and the other projects and between the projects themselves. So in the, in the big P medicine project, interestingly, this one is led by a pediatric oncologist. Imagine that, a clinician who's decided to run an EU project worth about 15 million euros. Why is he doing that? Because he's a bit of a visionary, is Norbert Graf, and does firmly believe that the future in this space is going to be dictated by how we manage information technology. So he's now set up a, a, a sizable project depending on three sets of clinical trials in the cancer area, breast cancer, leukemia, and Wilms tumor, which is a childhood uh, renal cancer. And we're tasked with developing uh, infrastructure for that. I mentioned the immense architecture before. Now we're going from the centralized database we had there to a federated one. Do you remember I discussed uh, University of London and University College London? This is the picture in this project that we have a data warehouse that, uh, and uh, at UCL we're responsible for building this thing and then the other uh, members will be developing tools and services and the hospitals all over Europe have responsibility for pushing Re appropriately anonymized or pseudonymized data into that warehouse with the intention of then having so much data we can start to enhance clinical decision making. There's another project called VPH Share. I don't have that much time to talk about it. I'm involved in that. The key thing here is they're doing the third form of data 
management, that's cloud services. They've actually got a project that's paid to look at managing data it by third parties, and I think they're using the Amazon cloud. We're, we're also involved in, in that project. So the people in P Medicine would run a mile before they started putting their data into a cloud. That's because this project doesn't really have many clinicians. The other project is totally driven by clinicians. Quite a few of them are German, and they don't want their data in third-party uh, environments. So all of this speaks to challenges in terms of managing uh, biomedical data. We hear a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of uh, bioinformatics initiatives in the last few years. One of the, the big challenges that still remains is how we merge or bring together that discipline with what you could call medical informatics or biomedical informatics, which is sort of done. You can think of it as to do with the bi uh, electronic health records and the data that is managed by clinicians. The idea being that if you can complete the circle in this way, reuse clinical data in a research environment, you expect to add value to it, and you'd like to then put it back into a clinical context. So there are projects that are being looked at on, in a strategic connection funded by the EU. When the EU asks for projects like this, it's suggesting there may be funding looming uh, in the future if you can prove that uh, there are things that could be done here, that the InBiomed Vision project led by Fran Sanz in Barcelona is tasked with dealing with that. So I want to quickly move to some of the e-infrastructure projects that exist, we're involved in, concerned with how we harness them for biomedical data, particularly in Europe. One of the things is Elixir. That's going ahead now, and it's primarily driven by the need to manage this explosion of genome data across Europe. The European Bioinformatics Institute in Cambridge is, is driving this strongly, but there are many other projects involved. And one wants to have this an underpinning uh, environment to support a lot of different research projects, themselves large ones, along the research and discovery spectrum. These slides were provided to me by Ewan Burney, who's at uh, the EBI there. And so he's one of the people pr promoting this strongly. We have Elixir nodes. The central kind of hub is imagined to be the EBI itself. And then different types of network within this are required data, training, and compute networks. Let's just uh, quickly review what's been going on in the technology. I well remember Tony Hay several years ago when eScience was getting going. We're all preparing for the petascale, petabytes of data from CERN, uh, because that was always going to happen. It was a bit, bit like fusion. We were never quite sure when the machines would start, and they started and then stopped. All the while, other things were going along. We had the two billion uh, sorry, yeah, roughly $3 billion uh, uh, dollar human genome project that was sort of announced in draft form at the turn of the millennium, and people thought that was interesting, but nothing really was going on and helpful, uh, actually in a kind of medical sense for that. Well, I, I have news for you. Just look at the speed at which the technology has evolved here in the 10 years or so since that took place. What's most important here is just looking at the top right-hand corner, at the turn of the millennium, it was maybe five years to get a whole human genome sequenced. With the technology as it is now, it takes six minutes, and it's costing of the order of $1,000. It doesn't take you much time to realize that this is shrinking all the time. We're not far away from the $100 uh, genome. And then all the things that I said to you about um, managing personal genome sequences become very relevant. EU-DAT is one of these projects that's now getting going across Europe to build a persistent e-infrastructure, and that's designed to support a whole range of communities, VPH being one of them. We're in there to try and make sure it de delivers. What's interesting, apart from the ambition to provide a persistent data infrastructure, is that many of the resource providers here are themselves supercomputing centers, too. Speaking to what I said earlier, don't forget that when you run simulations on supercomputers, petascale machines, they produce terabytes and petabytes of data as well. We need the data to be as uh, storage systems to be close together. I don't think I've got time to tell you much about uh, the multi-scale components of this. There was a delightful workshop uh, that ran yesterday on all of this. So, uh, but multi-scale modeling and simulation is going to become one of the dominating areas for modeling and simulation across most sciences in the future because the real problems that we can't address but are interesting, such as those for human body and medicine, have many, many scales on them. We have to be able to integrate our data 
and our models, and typically we have to work in distributed environments to do this. So we have projects on the go there. Petascale, uh, supercomputing. There's been several projects just announced in the EU. One that we're involved in called Cresta is looking at what, what we're going to do when the, mach the next wave of exascale machines evolve, which may have billions of cores on them. Instead of waiting for them to arrive and then understanding how to deal with it, let's plan now in a co-design sense for the use of these machines, take the codes that look best suited for touch applications and develop them with the, the auto-tuning and other tools that exist so that we're ready or we can take decisions to go away from models that are going to never scale to that level. If you remember, I mentioned something about Lattice Boltzmann simulations earlier. I'm prepared to put uh, quite a lot of money on the fact that, that, that Lattice Boltzmann codes are going to scale to as many cores as you give me. We already, our codes already scale to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cores. That's just because the communications are so low. We don't use fast Fourier transforms. So if you're serious about this scale for the human body, putting lots of complicated things on a big machine, then you might need to think about Lattice Boltzmann if until now you've been using continuum methods because those methods, spectral methods, are always relying on fast Fourier transforms and they're not going to be able to survive at that scale. Uh, EU is now looking to Horizon 2020. That would have been called FP8, one of the transition projects. Maybe the virtual physiological human will be called the digital patient uh, in, frame, in Horizon 2020. There's a roadmap now being developed for that which is all about bringing the data together from these various levels, the electronic health records and so on, into a single uh, in silico environment. This is a picture of the digital me that's behind it, all the data that could go into such systems to inform a citizen. It's no longer just patients we're talking about. It's you, know, you and me, you don't need to be ill to be able to exploit this if you wish for your own lifestyle choices. Last off, yet another EU project. This one's enough to blow anyone's mind if you're following what the EU does, uh, a future emerging technology. So again, information technology behind this. Six projects have been shortlisted. Each one of those is being paid a cool 1.5 million euros to write a proposal, because if they're successful, they'll get a billion euros over 10 years. That's 100 million per year. And one of them, we're involved in actually, led by Hans Lerach, in Berlin is called the IT future of medicine. And as far as I'm concerned, this is just taking VPH to the next level. And if you wanted a catchphrase, you had the $3 billion human genome in 2000, this would be the project that takes that to the next level where everyone could have their own genome sequence. And I think there, we have lots of things going on at UCL now which reflect the importance of all of this strategic, strategically to UCL because it's a very big biomedical institution that's now putting all of its efforts behind this. Those slides just speak to that. I'm running out of time, so that, that's a, a rather sort of um, inadequate list of people who have helped in some of the work that I've discussed here and a bunch of projects that fund us or are involved in. With that, I will stop and thank you very much for your attention. Hi, so you were talking about the importance of rapid uh, response for medical systems. I was wondering if there was much investigation in the use of GPGPU, general purpose GPU computing, for that? Yeah, of course there is. Um, um, if, you've got, if you've got codes, so we have quite a few. For example, you may have inferred, if you weren't aware, we do a lot of lattice bolts and modeling and simulation. So in the case of that genius project where we want to get the answers back in a hurry, at this moment, we, I would say we're involved in feasibility studies to show that we can do this in a validated, feasible way. And we currently use multi-core machines, up to tens of thousands of cores, but we have separate endeavors on the go to look at the porting. There are people in this room who know that you can run lattice Boltzmann codes very efficiently on GPGPUs. And the merit of that is they'll be cheap, you won't need as many cores, and if this era really kicks off, most of the time, the computational resources will have to be in a hospital environment. That's the type of architecture we'll need for that. So there's plenty of scope for that, and we're fully aware of it. It brings new challenges and expertise to bear.
Thank you, Peter, for a fantastic presentation, really showing how computational bioscience really goes into most of the areas in e-science. So if you flip the coin around and then asking, what other areas of e-science really has developed tools and technology that could be really useful in computational bioscience and the challenges as of today? I mean, for example, in Beijing, they shipped hardware using FedEx as an infrastructure for shipping information. What other areas? Could it be climate modeling or? Oh, you mean d other domains than the biomedical one? Other, other domains in e-science that could be really useful for biomed biomedical sciences challenges as of today, or is it just the unique challenges? Uh, I'm not, still not quite sure I'm understanding you. If you wanted to talk about the climate thing, are you saying let's go off and talk about that now as a separate example? I mean, do we have tools and methods from other areas of e-science that could really be useful in biomedical sort yeah, of challenges? Okay, so today? the answer to that is, uh, I thought I was trying to convey that, the importance yeah. all the time of what's happened up till now, learning from some mistakes, and the importance of standards where we can, open source methods, and being sure we comply with those standards, and then building complicated systems from components that do interoperate, so that the bits we're using to build the more complicated things we know will work. When the more complicated thing falls over, as it inevitably will, we don't have to go back to square one and a tabula rasa, but we can look for alternative solutions or build parts of the problem. That's the general thing, and in the generic sense, that's what's useful for all these cases. And the data, yeah, climate is an example which is rather similar to this. It's plain that you need huge quantities of data, you also need to do a lot of computation. Peter, um, uh, uh, doing computational modeling to assist a surgeon, uh, and so that the surgeon makes some uh, actual operation on, as a result of what he sees on the screen, are computational modelers insured against errors? The, the thing is that if you talk to a clinician about this, you'll find that, that they come and they're very interested in this, for the reason I gave you earlier. And there is some kind of fundamental misconception here that if I'm dealing with a human system I better have ultra high fidelity or it's no use whatsoever. These people are usually making decisions on the fly. Their decisions, I gave you examples in interventional neuroradiology, may be 40% success rates. You supply them with something that potentially can help them in their decision, they'll take it. It doesn't need to be you know, ultra high fidelity and this is the, the issue, it's not black and white it will increase over time as surely as anything is done in modeling and simulation. But we don't want to say we can do nothing until we've got this utopian scenario which we'll never reach. So we have to be very careful about it. Verification and validation are central to this. And I'm not trying to put anyone under any illusion that someone's about to launch a simulation to save someone's life. I've personally been asked that question. How many lives have I saved? This is ridiculous. It's going to be clinicians and r rules and regulations that are established to how you integrate simulation into these contexts. But the FDA, for example, has, has already started to put down benchmarks for fluid dynamic simulation, what you've got to achieve before they'll take you seriously. I, I mean, it just seems to me that, that the, the medical field being what it is, don't forget I live in the States now, which is very litigatious, that it seems unlikely there won't be lawsuits about Oh, I'm quite sure there will be things. lawsuits. That's why we need law lawyers of all sorts in this game. But uh, the, th the thing is that whether you use modeling and simulation in the Popperian sense that I was suggesting we're moving towards, or you use modeling and simulation according to the other knight of the British realm, Sir Francis Bacon, they were both knights, by the way, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to have to deal with the problem that you, you predict someone should be treated by such and such a, uh, a method or a drug, and it may turn out not to be correct. And you're in far worse trouble if you use Sir Francis Bacon's approach because there's no underlying model. It's just the statistics. 60% of the people who we treat with this medicine will be cured. As I said earlier, the 40% who aren't have no better knowledge of what they should do. This is incrementally the only way to enhance medical treatment. Yes, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, I would like, want to ask you whether you have some advice um, for somebody who, like me who is working in the bioinformatics domain. 
how to interact or, or approach the colleagues from the from the medical informatics sides so to build these bridges i mean what would be the first steps that you would uh, suggest well uh, i think one of them i've already mentioned it's breaking barriers down one one of the problems is uh, actually another problem is electronic health records and the lack thereof in any case there are now some countries in europe who i reliably am informed actually do have centralized e-health records but but the uk for example is nowhere near that so a lot of data is just scattered still, pa pencil, uh, paper and stuff. If you had a bank and you went to that bank and you wanted internet access to control your money and they told you, sorry, we can't do that, all your data is just scattered on paper in different banks, you'd go off to another bank. There's no reason why we can't solve this problem in the health area just as easily. There's no more technical solution demanded. Nobody... I believe, well, I would suggest most people would be far more concerned that they didn't get their bank account hacked than that their personal medical data was broken into. So the security component of it is not serious. It's to do with how you get people to put the data in a digital form, some of its usability, and then the Fort Knox problem where we don't want to allow other people to get access to it. So there's quite a lot of a men you know, mental issue there. And both partners looking in different directions. The bioinformaticians don't ever want to worry about security issues. And this has to be bridged. Thanks, Peter. So the protein folding problem still lays unsolved. And it's a key obstacle to drug discovery. Is there a roadmap proposed already to overcome this problem, given the approaches that you just suggested? So, Bernard, you're talking about the full-blown protein folding problem, which is, if I've given the primary sequence of a protein of arbitrary length, can I predict the three-dimensional structure Indeed, of yes. it? I wasn't talking exactly about that. That has actually, again, it has a Baconian approach. There are CASP studies for this. But if you want to do a Popperian one, it's folding the thing. And I think you may be aware, as I am, we use uh, well, the greatest thing that ever came out of Wall Street was D.E. Shaw and the development of a, of a dedicated piece of hardware called Anton and the software that goes sort of with it sometimes. Because at this moment, he invested all his billions that he made on Wall Street and got out before the collapse of 2008 in dedicated hardware there. So currently, that's the best game in town. You can run on 512 cores and get folding you know, many orders of magnitude faster than you can on conventional architectures, but it's still getting us into uh, maybe milliseconds just about now. So certain things are beginning to fold, small enough proteins that way, but there are lots of technical issues, you know, to do with parameterizations. It's going to happen in that space not too far away, but it's not quite the same problem as I was describing here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.